very much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to this workshop. I've learned uh, this is not the first time for you to have this kind of workshop around this time. I admire your, uh, your work style and appreciate it. I imagine uh, if I do, if we do this at my university, nobody comes. <laughs> so I really appreciate your interest uh, in this. And uh, so I am from Kyoto University, and uh, uh, I'll be talking about uh, my background and uh, my past experience a little bit uh, in this workshop. But uh, I uh, returned to Japan seven years ago, and I was in the States for 20 years. And uh, I don't need to say this, but uh, my uh, great uh, English class uh, during my middle school and high school was very, very bad. Uh, but I can, I'm glad I can speak English like this now. <laughs> so, uh, any rate, uh, and I asked Kami, uh, and she kindly uh, sent you uh, an email note, I believe, and to bring your own device. And so either a laptop or uh, you know, smartphone or tablet, uh, and uh, assuming it's uh, on online, and I'm going to use, uh, try to use, I hope the technology is going to uh, cooperate um, uh, online tools uh, during this session to uh, try to make it more interactive. So uh, please, Yimson, join and uh, I'll let you know uh, when is the time. So there I use uh, a few, few times, more than a few times. So uh, again, uh, I think you read this maybe uh, when uh, you heard about this uh, workshop. And uh, I'm going to try to cover you know, this. Uh, maybe uh, you know, not everything, but I'll try to uh, do that um, too. And uh, just quickly, uh, you know, this is the website you know, so far where I work, uh, the center you know, uh, for the promotions of excellence in higher education are uh, quite worried. And what we do uh, at our center is, uh, you see with the four boxes uh, you know, here, and uh, the first thing is to support education reform, and also uh, uh, help faculty to develop their professional skills. And also, uh, this has been a growing in an area. We're using uh, technology uh, in uh, teaching and learning, too. And I'm going to talk uh, a lot about this, too. And uh, lastly, uh, but it's also very important, uh, we do uh, uh, evaluations on teaching and also learning. And so we support uh, primarily department and faculty members. But, uh, but also, uh, you know, working with you know, some departments, um, graduate schools, and other centers um, to uh, you know, advance the teaching and learning you know, at our institution and beyond. So I'd like to start uh, with this uh, slide um, to talk about uh, some interesting you know, some, uh, aspect you know, some of uh, innovation. And I took just front covers of two magazines. Uh, the left one is, uh, this is typical, like gadget, um, this kind of technology uh, I can use uh, in a classroom, um, right? Uh, electric uh, whiteboard, you know, so any kind, you know, sub technology. And uh, so this one, uh, probably you can call this, uh, I'm glad you can read, of course, you can share with the Chinese character so you can <laughs> understand this, so we say this in Japanese too. So uh, everybody can understand easily the left one. But the right one is kind of a tricky one. Uh, this was a, a front cover of the Time magazine uh, several years ago, uh, when it had the special issue on the very unique education research um, done by some American researchers. Uh, what they did you know, was they came to uh, a classroom, elementary school classroom, and tell all the kids, if we get a better score on the next exam, we'll give you cash. <laughs> Sounds very American. <laughs> but uh, you guess uh, what happened? So they didn't try to use any new tools, they didn't change the way they teach, uh, but almost all the 
advocates uh, got better school. So I don't know if this is discouraging, innocent or promising. <laughs> if that's, uh, you know, it doesn't cost anything to tell kids, well, it will uh, cost at the end, you know, if you need, need to give cash, innocent to your kids. But uh, if that's uh, incentive and motivation, that's all we need. Is you know why don't we spend so much time and money on uh, you know new technology or new pedagogies? So, but that's that's a really cultural thing, and I think many educators uh, or you know everybody, even parents, don't like you know just a cash incentive you know for kids to learn. But actually, this is interesting because well, if we ask. Why you go to high school? Why you go to college? Why you go to graduate school? Part of you know, people's incentive is getting a better job or getting better salary, right? Or making big money. So again, it's actually part you know, of the culture you know, of education all over you know, the world. So, uh, so we can't forget you know, some this aspect uh, when we think about innovation. And it, uh, so uh, we need both, both uh, sides, so technology and culture here. And so this is a good example. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, so I was reading this kind of juvenile you know, magazine. And uh, so I just took uh, one old uh, drawing you know, from the old magazine. And this is what we Japanese were imagining the future uh, classroom 50 years ago. And so you see, was partly right, right? Everybody have device, uh, but not the, you know, not this or tablet or fancy laptop. So this is what they were able to imagine 50 years ago. But it's good, you know, because uh, around that time there is no personal computer anyway, uh, and there is no teacher uh, standing in front of a blackboard. Uh, in fact, there's no blackboard and just the projected screen. So we kind of have that too. I'm going to talk about online education, MOOC, um, and that's a part of it. But uh, if you look carefully, um, there's some robots uh, moving around kids and beating up innocent kids. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I don't know, I, actually I talked with uh, uh, provost of uh, uh, National University of Singapore before and he said you know, he became a great uh, mathematician because uh, you know, his school teachers uh, were beating him up when he got a bad score or something. So, and uh, I, as I uh, remember, uh, that was happening in Japanese classroom too. So again, you know, we could laugh uh, this maybe now, but uh, uh, they were not joking. You know, it's not about this. They they, they were thinking maybe uh, efficiency, effect <laughs> effectiveness, right? Uh, robots coming to help, you know, uh, teacher to beating up, you know, some kids if they are not focusing on things or not doing the right things too. So once again, this is a cultural aspect, right? Uh, if you know, this is totally no no things in Jap at Japanese schools now. But again, because the culture has changed, not a whole lot, but at least at this part. And uh, you know, if you could just work through with me uh, what has happened, you know, over the last thirty years and now. Um, so this is interesting. Uh, you know, for nineteen nineties. Um, this is pretty much a, a kind of European American uh, kind of timeline. So, uh, like Japan, it's maybe five years, you know, a little behind in you know, this timeline. But uh, this is uh, a Professor Answers in the States uh, wrote a very interesting article, and he was uh, calling in the 1990s E decade and also 2000 O decade. So, uh, if you remember. Uh, maybe uh, you're too young to remember EDK. Um, there was a lot of things happening because of the internet was emerging, and uh, so this e movement, you know, everything you know uh, goes on internet or uh, you know becoming uh, more electronic, electronic, to e-commerce, e-business, e-publishing, e-learning. And then once it's done, 
the next 10 uh, decades, it's the beginning of the 21st century, uh, he called this all decade. And open source, open system, you know, open standards, access, open research, you name. And it's still going on, of course. It started uh, pretty much in early uh, 2000s. And I'm going to talk, talk about open education. And uh, uh, it started uh, really uh, the 2001. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that later. So beginning of this century. Then, so his uh, article, uh, Professor Answorth's article stopped. And I just couldn't, uh, I'm curious, George, and so I couldn't uh, stop myself thinking about the, what we should call the CD in the next decade. And somehow I came up with, so I made it up. There's no theoretical background in it. I came up you know, with C decade. And the C is very convenient, as you can see. Uh, collaboration, collectivity, communi uh, communities, commons, cloud computing. So it's a lot of things, actually, interestingly, starting with C. So this is where I... Uh, you know, we are reading, you know, some video. And, but, of course, uh, somebody uh, asked me nasty questions about, well, you know, professors, uh, CDK is really ending. <laughs> and so are you not ready for the next, uh, you know, some decade? So I had to come up with something again. And guess what? Uh, so I came up with this PDK. And again, <laughs> I, you know, it's a very convenient personalizations, preference based prediction, proactiveness, uh, you know, and uh, as you know, project-based and uh, project-based, program-based and project-based. Playable, uh, tomorrow uh, we have a gamification uh, panel I learned, uh, so playable is very good. And also privacy is uh, getting a big concern of uh, uh, every aspect, in every aspect of our life. So, uh, it is starting already. But uh, I think there will be uh, uh, more of you know, these things uh, in society and in education, too. I don't know if, if any of you remember this. <laughs> um, this is the first electronic toy uh, to, for kids to learn something. Um, and it was born only you know, 40 years ago. And, uh, well, program a little bit. Um, don't be fooled, please. And, uh, this is this stands for Future of Our Learning. And I'm working on my uh, online course uh, named Fool to see if it's going to come. And uh, but that's the real title is the Future of Our Learning. And uh, so I actually uh, miss Innocent these good old days uh, where we are collecting gadgets. Um, and when we had this uh, uh, language laboratory, you know, where there's open little you know, tape recorders, and we were like, uh, you know, spy and JC training, uh, you know, just listening in you know, head, big headphones, and then, uh, you know, repeating, you know, what tape said. And uh, over time, you know, of course, then personal computer came, you know, it's a laser disk, and all these expensive, and cumbersome, you know, devices uh, we've been using, you know, so over the last several years, you know, so, so. But supplies, supplies. These days, we don't need these gadgets. I play uh, musical uh, synthesizers, for example. And when I was in high school or college, you know, college, all the, the synthesizers are very, very expensive, if you remember. Um, you know. Maybe a one month salary, you know, so it was expensive, um, and kids couldn't afford. These days, all those old synthesizers, it's a virtualized. I mean, you know, so you can get stuff like a ten dollars, um, you know, some works on your laptop or pad, and you could have like a thirty synthesizers, virtual synthesizers, on your computer, with a fraction of money, you know, we used to spend. So it's, everything is virtualized. And the same thing happened you know, here to educational tools. You know, all these expensive you know, machines, gadgets, now pretty much all you know, available on smartphone. It's quite amazing. And a lot of them are free 
you know, so we're very inexpensive. So it's amazing, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of these applications for learning and teaching are available, you know, some these days. So uh, we can say, uh, you know, these technologies, uh, you know, have become uh, commoditized and the platform. And so this is interestingly the fate, you know, so this kind of technology. Uh, if you remember, and those, uh, I don't know, Hongkongese people are not crazy about it, but, uh, uh, you know, people from mainland, you know, still uh, want to buy as a souvenir, uh, it's a Japanese rice cooker. <laughs> it has only seven, you know, 70, uh, about 70, uh, no, uh, 60, no, I think, 65 years history. So uh, the first uh, electric um, rice cooker was invented in 1955. And as I recall, uh, around 1980s, when a microchip, you know, microcomputer, uh, you know, some came, you know, sh showed up, then uh, everybody's interested in putting some microchip into all the home electronics. And so uh, I remember uh, when I was like middle school, high school, uh, at one point the uh, rice cookers became very, very complicated. It's almost like a, you have to be programmer <laughs> to program, you know, some rice cookers. It can do anything, but uh, it has so many functions uh, and it's but very hard. And a lot of people started complaining, and you know, different older people. Older people. So it has sophisticated, just like operating system, um, and so over time, you know, the, it has been very smart and uh, simple. And now maybe you can just talk to the rice, you know, I need what, you know, and then uh, the next morning you have a perfect rice, you know, steamed rice, and it's all done. And uh, now I think Japanese rice cook, you know, cookers makers are competing into switch others with what material they used inside. You know, this could be a very special kind of steel, uh, like, you know, uh, you know and this one, uh, like 300 years ago, you know, people are using special kind of steel, and they try to use the same materials, you know, for this very modern, you know, uh, rice. So, uh, to summarize, um, so this is a fate, you know, some technology, and the smart technology is becoming increasingly invisible and uh, intangible. So it's happening in this right now, and so what becomes more important is not technology tools, but kind of recipe, you know, so, or uh, how to teach, how to learn, kind of things. And there are dozens, you know, so, uh, pedagogical options. You know, as you see here. So, uh, you li uh, listen enough, so uh, please get your device and uh, uh, let's do a little uh, kind of survey that uh, I call idea sharing. You know, and uh, you'll see, uh, wait for a few seconds here. Good. So, it's very uh, Easy. It's in, uh, maybe, maybe some of you have uh, used this before. It's called Menti, uh, Mentimeter. So uh, if you go to uh, your browser, browser, and just go to uh, menti.com. Just go to menti.com. You don't need to sign up anything, but uh, you should see a little, you know, blank uh, there, and then then uh, ask you to put some code. And uh, please put uh, these six digits. Code, uh, no space required in between, uh, 37, 54, 43. Do you get it? Then you should see uh, this question you know, on your screen. And uh, I see a nodding. So, uh, and so please um, put whatever, uh, you know, this time uh, apps, tools, uh, you know, so you use uh, on your device or laptop you know, and when you enter then hit submit I think
it could be very short. Uh, this is uh, almost like a Twitter uh, style, uh, so you can't uh, write actually long. Uh, I think that's the uh, same uh, limit, uh, character number limit to the to Twitter. So who wants to be the first responder here? Have you submitted? Not? Yes? Oh, good, good. So uh, the first one just came up. So we'll see uh, YouTube. And it's okay, uh, you know, if you overlap, your uh, answer will overlap with others. Ah, yeah, Kafut uh, is very, pro, uh, you know, very popular too. What's a uh, uh, Socrative uh, way of uh, enter this? Uh, I, I'm not familiar. Can it, anybody uh, explain uh, what Socrative is? Oh, please, please. Yeah. At that's an app, uh, we can put up some questions for students to answer the quick answer. So, so something like this? Yeah, maybe? yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So. I used to be using uh, the device called Clicker. <laughs> and <laughs> like a remote control, <laughs> TV remote control like things. And uh, But the, the problem with that is uh, it needs, you know, individual uh, remote controllers. And I keep missing. You know, losing you know, those <laughs> remote controllers because some people might think uh, you know I can use this at home that they can't. But <laughs> at any rate, so uh, you yeah, know YouTube, Coursera, and edX. Thank you. It's a MOOC. I'm going to talk about it a little bit too. Um, VoiceTube. Ah, uh, so th this is uh, VoiceTube is more like uh, just listening, I guess. Uh, and Blackboard, uh, is this not the real Blackboard, I, I, I guess? But, uh, huh. Well, there used to be, um, still, you know, there is a learning management system called Blackboard, but I assume this is different Blackboard. Maybe there is a Blackboard, uh, you know, hundreds of different applications called Blackboard <laughs> uh, in the world. But that's interesting. IPR. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, who said IPR? You? Yes. Would you uh, explain? Maybe I'm the only one who who don't know. <laughs> I actually know very little about it. It's um, it's, it's one of the um, it's sort of like that. It, it basically lets all the students they could um, after the session they could evaluate you know mm. how much the session been and what they have learned from it. And you yes. can also ask them questions about it as well. Huh. So it's, it's uh, sounds sounds it's, it's like, like a, a complicated, but it's like a slightly more comprehensive version of you reply. Okay. You reply is the one that you can you can put put their heads up in the app and you can pick a student from that one. Mm -hmm. so okay. Just a, so it looks like a few kind of different kinds of uh, tools you usually uh, normally use and the things um, interesting, right? So one is a different like uh, you know YouTube voice tube. Like um, you, you can watch or listen and on, uh, kind of things. And of course, Coursera, edX, these are uh, uh, online courses. And uh, uh, other, uh, you know, also game, you know, some, uh, you know, like a food. 
and also uh, some kind of quizzing, you know, peer learning uh, kind of tools. Um, so these are the kinds, uh, and it's a very uh, popular uh, among you know, you. So it's very interesting. Because it, it, it is interesting if I ask this uh, to different in different country and they, and they all say different things too. So thank you very much. So um, so you've covered already you know, some by submitting your uh, favorite you know, some apps here. But uh, these are kind of a trends, uh, the I call impact factors of technology and with you know learning. And openness, uh, you know, ubiquity, ubiquity is, uh, you know, bring your own device kind of thing. AI, gamification, uh, learning analytics, um, and blended learning, that kind of things. And uh, so I uh, told you I returned to Japan seven years ago, and uh, uh, I was at MIT for three years. But before that, uh, I was working at a place called Carnegie Foundation. Uh, for 10 years, and that was uh, my longest tenure uh, until, uh, until now. And uh, uh, as I was exiting Innocent Foundation, I decided to uh, do this book project, and uh, I started uh, 2006, and that was a kind of a golden age, Innocent, of uh, early uh, open education. So uh, there are uh, dozens of uh, big projects who are flow, flourishing you know, around that time. And uh, maybe you can recognize you know, some of the innocent things. And what we are tracing with these 38 authors, these are not just scholars, but the doers, you know, some too, leading these uh, big projects like Open Courseware and other open education projects. And I was very intrigued why they're working on this kind of open education project and what kind of uh, future you know, they're foreseeing by you know, immersing themselves in, with the colleagues in doing this kind of uh, opening up you know, some education. And this book, I uh, uh, set things up. Uh, so this, 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 there are three pillars, um, so to speak. Open technology, open content, open knowledge, and oh, uh, thank you for taking pictures. I'll actually share the slides at the end, so you can download the so PDF, so uh, uh, you can just listen and just download, you know, some way. Open technology, uh, as many of you know, there's open source technology, and there has been a lot of uh, open tools and open platforms, and. The second component is uh, open content. And again, YouTube you know, can be an open content now. Right? Uh, it, there wasn't YouTube around the time. But uh, over the 20 years, last 20 years, been increasing um, enormous, enormous numbers of open content available. And uh, again, 2001, uh, MIT announced open courseware. This was made a really big splash. Um, and if you remember, in uh, the same uh, in the same year, there was uh, you know this Al Qaeda's you know terrorist attack, and a uh, uh, very sad you know, incident. But uh, as we recall, uh, it was the beginning, the first year of the 21st century. These are two big you know uh, incidents, kind of uh, similar. In a way, it's using uh, you know very ordinary technology, ordinary technology to do something amazing. And of course the terrorist attack is a bad thing. But you know this education open education, open course is a good thing. Why you know MIT, you know one of the uh, most privy, uh, prestigious private universities, uh, decided to open up all the uh, you know precious expensive educational content and made it free, made them freely available, right? So that's uh, uh, again the culture, philosophy, you know, of education, uh, not the technology. Right? And of course, the many uh, universities follow us. You know, uh, we uh, started the Kyoto University in 2005, and still doing. And the last uh, component, again, this at the uh, point uh, 2008, uh, was open knowledge. 
the online open online education wasn't uh, open online courses but like MOOC not there yet and so people are very excited about this open openly sharing knowledge of teaching and learning and so uh, how you learn and how you teach and uh, you know if you like uh, been school teachers for 30 years you have accumulated a wealth of uh, great experience knowledge in good teaching and student learning right it's all in your brain and unless you want to share you know you're going to bring that to uh, maybe your grave right and so again how can that knowledge great knowledge uh, inside the head of many teachers, you know, thing, uh, can be shared. So that's uh, what we were tackling at Carnegie Foundation and uh, uh, all the other uh, great places uh, on the planet. So, but uh, to make uh, the long story short, you know, something here, um, by opening, opening, so we talked about open technology and open content, um, but again, we, we started sharing how best we can take advantage, how best we can use those uh, tools and resources, then we can do a lot more in a lot better way too. So also that's why the, this knowledge part is so crucial. So we call it the triple play in you know, the uh, of open education in you know, here. You know, learners can use whatever you know, the website or resources or videos, and share how great it was and how he or she used that for what. And the teachers can do the thing, and we could just exchange knowledge among this uh, uh, community of practice. And as a community, you know, so we can keep evolving, again, you know, deepening, you know, some knowledge and also coming up a better use in a snow too. And uh, so that's really the, the meat, you know, so the work uh, my colleagues and I were doing for 10 years uh, in sunny California. Uh, our office is still in a snow on Stanford University campus. And called Knowledge Laboratory, it's gone, uh, we left and so we, you know, are creating a bunch of tools and a platform, you know, from there. Um, and in, in tomorrow's uh, my keynote, uh, I'm going to talk a little more about this. So I'll try to uh, uh, moving through quickly here. But uh, there is a, a very uh, closed kind of private space, you know, for uh, select, you know, teachers, scholars, uh, discuss, examine, peer review, you know, some their teaching. And also, they can quickly document um, you know, some of what they've been doing, what kind of challenges they're facing, how they overcome. Kind of thing. And then, uh, in kind of an electric portfolio kind of way, but it's really on steroids. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good uh, expression or not. Uh, and so, they could actually uh, show off uh, in you know, in very effective way uh, what they have learned uh, through their kind of teaching educational improvement in a certain effort. And so uh, uh, again, you know, the knowledge can be created. Knowledge is actually there, but it can be captured and then documented and shared. Then we used in you know, some by others. And then uh, we created at the end of this journey, we created this place called the Teaching Learning Commons. So this is very uh, YouTube-ish uh, space. And again, the YouTube was there uh, when we launched this in 2004. Uh, but many people still kind of skeptical you know, about YouTube. Why we need you know, some, this space? It's totally unimaginable now. Everybody uses YouTube. But the people are like, wow, well, you know, maybe there's a bunch of uh, you know, kids' videos, you know, taken by fathers and mothers and just uh, sharing among the family members and that's the uh, only use we can think of uh, think about the YouTube you might laugh if you're young um, but again that's the way uh, we're imagining so we've been uh, we did the same thing against teachers uh, submitting in uploading 
the bunch of you know these uh, electric portfolios and then uh, learn from each other, just like watching YouTube. And we got uh, over two hundred thousand, you know, so e portfolio around the world, and uh, people are actually interestingly peer reviewing. And then there was like a playlist, you know, my favorite, you know, works by others, and then you can comment on. And these uh, uh, playlists can was were also being shared among these, you know, hundreds of thousands of people there. Then I moved to uh, MIT and helping you know, some departments and faculty members to again effectively document you know, some of their work with evidence. You know, very important, uh, especially in places like MIT. You know, people rather want to spend more time and effort in research than teaching. But I learned um, those crazy you know, researchers, very fanatic you know, researchers, can be very fanatic educators. Once they see kind of a research element in their teaching, improving their teaching and student learning. One professor I met, uh, and you can maybe Google and find him, uh, told, you know, came to me and said, Toru, I found some secret. My doubt about a lot of students were cheating you know, each other's <laughs> own of final exam or just regular exams. Um, and uh, I tried to find what that affected uh, in some to their long time performance, academic performance. And uh, he was secretly investigating, collecting data, and finally proved that cheating on the exam didn't take those uh, bright students anywhere. <laughs> so, so again, uh, you know, he actually wrote paper, showed me the draft paper, and he said, this is just for you. I cannot publish because this would be a shame, you know, so of MIT. <laughs> and then, but then later he published. <laughs> so if you're interested, I can uh, share that with you um, too. But again, the, uh, you know, what's interesting about this story is he just couldn't stop himself. He was researching in you know, students cheating you know, in each other and just learning, right? So again, when they uh, were um, put, you know, their researchers had, as an educator, you know, good things you know, may happen. Um, so again, uh, working with a number of uh, MIT faculty members, you know, some there, and like, like this, uh, you know, great professor, uh, you know, Haynes Miller, uh, spending a lot of effort, time, to create these open uh, simulations, you know, mathematical simulations, where, you know, people can play with these simulation tools to learn a mathematical concept. And got dozens of great muscles. And, uh, uh, you know, even at, at a place like MIT, you know, some students are not good at grasping, you know, some mathematical concept, and it's very useful. And also, uh, uh, they found uh, those, uh, you, know, people, you know, students who are not uh, doing well in physics, also uh, are very weak, you know, have weakened, you know, uh, have, you know uh, they, they usually have a very weak um, foundations, you know, uh, mathematical you know, some, uh, concept as well. So uh, they are actually encouraging, you know, some, uh, those uh, MIT students to use. But also, of course, uh, uh, Haynes, uh, you know, decided to make it totally open to uh, all learners, you know, uh, around the world too. So this, you know, page or uh, portfolio documented uh, with his, his help, like why he started making this how these uh, simulations were, have been used, and then what he and his colleagues learned, kind of things, again, you know, with the evidence, too. And this uh, work, uh, you know, I'm continue, continuing uh, with my colleagues uh, at Kyoto University, so this is Japanese, but actually you can, you know, read some Chinese characters <laughs> here, <laughs> again. Um, but, 
So, uh, you know, we did a lot um, in Carnegie Foundations, MIT, Kyoto University, uh, in my, it's my experience. And, but still, you know, we found it's not easy to, uh, so, you know, everyone can say, well, yes, yeah, I can learn from Professor X, Professor Y was great, you know, they did a great job. Uh, in improving, you know, so they're teaching with student and learning. But that's it. You know, that knowledge uh, or whatever they learned cannot be used in, you know, like the next day in their own classroom. Okay? <coughs> so because, you know, it's nice, even it's nicely documented, it has its own context of learning and teaching. And it's different uh, from discipline to uh, discipline and uh, level, you know, grade level. And so it's not really that transferable, you know, in that sense. So, uh, so we really wanted to try something new, and then uh, we came, sorry again, this is a Japanese pamphlet, uh, it's called uh, Most Treasure. Uh, what it is, it is uh, like very um, bite-sized, you know, uh, idea or method. Everybody can implement, no matter, you know, if that's uh, elementary school teachers or high school teachers, or university professor. So it's uh, uh, very uh, commoditized, you know, it's uh, uh, you know, bulk zone you know, to, uh, of uh, uh, good education. And so we ask you know, many educators to come up with a bite-sized, transferable, you know, micro-educational innovations or idea uh, we can share by many others. So uh, we've you know, been experimenting with this. And uh, uh, so the, the content, uh, sorry again in Japanese, um, but a lot of interesting ideas. Sometimes uh, you need a little toy or trick you know, to get uh, students engaged. Uh, it doesn't need uh, expensive tools or online tools. But where we got this idea from uh, at our center is very interesting. There is, uh, maybe you have similar uh, web service, uh, we call a cookpot. Uh, it's uh, for moms, busy moms or dads, you know, who have to cook, but even don't have time to just go to the nearest the supermarket, right? So I need to open the refrigerator and see what we have now. <laughs> and then uh, in 10 minutes, uh, what we can cook, you know, for kids or by being for themselves. So again, uh, so we learned from this kind of a cook part, quick sharing, uh, you know, so whatever you can offer. Uh, and so we got uh, you know, education cookpot here. And we have uh, uh, more than cookpot, you know, some ideas, and that's uh, what we uh, created. At, uh, so if you, you know, Google uh, Kyoto University Connect, then you, you see really uh, uh, elaborated, you know, case studies of, uh, you know, how, uh, what are, uh, you know, whatever the educational innovations that Kyoto University faculty and sometimes students, you know, some have been created. So, um, the second time, um, to share your ideas. Um, so, uh, having heard, you know, what I have been uh, doing with my colleagues here and there, um, I like your uh, ideas and opinions, um, but what tools, platforms, opportunities, or venues uh, do you use? You know, at, at, for your professional work, um, you know, not everybody's teaching uh, here, I understand. Um, but uh, a way you can uh, share, you know, some, your uh, practical knowledge, you know, of, it, it doesn't need to be learning and teaching, you know, could, you know to perform your own job. Too. Do you have your favorite, you know, online communities or some kind of a knowledge base or so please uh, share uh, the same way. Uh, so this uh, here is a new number, uh, 445701. So please uh, punch this in and then start sharing.
provide you with kind of a way to think about this in the future. Here's sort of a planning document. You could identify a competing, two competing options, identify the underlying assumptions, and then look to the research base, look to peer-reviewed uh, research related to these questions and these responses, and then uh, consider context. What are the contextual considerations or modifications for your specific context? And finally, what, what should be your policy or practice response based on assumptions, evidence, and contextual modifications? And you can do that to compare various options, uh, like Teacher of America, No Child Left Behind. And that is it. Thank you very much. Uh, practical knowledge uh, can be know-how, right? Um, like when if I uh, fix something, <laughs> I usually go to like YouTube's and there is uh, instruction videos by somebody, so, you know, repaired um, what uh, washing machine, <laughs> whatever. Um, What's cool? Well, I imagine uh, maybe it's a similar, uh, you know, some tools like uh, so an SNS type yeah. of tools. Yes, uh, so face-to-face -face venues are still, uh, you know, very uh, effective and important. So interestingly, uh, as I uh, like you uh, reading through this, uh, it's a pretty uh, basic uh, SNS type, you know, sort of uh, platforms and tools, and we're still not uh, getting there yet. I mean, uh, like AI mediated, uh, like knowledge base, smart knowledge base type of uh, or supported kind of a community, you know, and yet it's, uh, almost uh, again, you know, face-to-face so, uh, -face, uh, venues um, opportunities are very important, but also a very basic kind of communication, uh, social networking, you know, some tools we are uh, depending on. But I think uh, this part uh, will be uh, uh, rapidly uh, in, you know, in advancing I think in the next five years or so, uh, it's in one way, uh, in one sense, it's matchmaking and make you know matching uh, what you need and uh, a person you need to talk with or uh, the knowledge piece of knowledge uh, you need to access in a sense too. And right now uh, we're doing a lot through you know our networked people uh, or uh, places. Um, but again, uh, it can be, uh, um, you know, mediated smartly in some by, you know, that kind of uh, system. 
So thank you, and uh, uh, maybe uh, you could just continue to uh, put uh, if you haven't finished yet. But let me just uh, keep working. And then, uh, but after this book was published, uh, that the MOOC, you know, boom, innocence started, was booming, right? And if you recall, uh, 2012 uh, was a big year. Um, you know, uh, New York Times called this a year of MOOC. And uh, uh, I think many people already know it was uh, started by uh, MOOC, original MOOC was started by the uh, two, well, one uh, sample professor with uh, Google uh, researchers, uh, AI researchers there. And uh, they just wanted uh, to know uh, what will happen. What would happen uh, is that they, they were teaching this uh, into the, uh, introduction to an AI course at Stanford to approximately 200 students, undergraduate students a year. And they got this idea, so why do we, what's going to happen if we do this uh, massive way, open way on the internet? And then, uh, again, over uh, this made a history and over 100,000 people registered. Among them, over 7,000 uh, students Pass the final, you know, some exam or quizzes, and um, so uh, again they were so excited because uh, again every year they can teach, you know, some to uh, two hundred students at Stanford, but uh, you know this is a thirty-five years worth, you know, people who pass, you know, uh, finished, you know, some this course in one year too. So then uh, everybody was, uh, as you know, uh, very excited about this, and uh, somebody put the uh, Coursera edX there. And uh, so it became the battle royale, I call the uh, uh, teaching staff professors. <laughs> Big shift happened. It's interesting because uh, when people, I mean, universities were excited about open courseware. There was like a, a arm wrestling among, you know, those big universities. But now it's the big shift happened. It more individual teachers, is laughters. You know, maybe a uh, you know, very famous professor at Harvard, you know, do a great teaching. But if he moved to somewhere, would that, you know, uh, deduce the value of his or her teaching? Of course, I don't think so. Right? So in that way, you know, people are freed, you know, from, you know, reputation or, uh, you know, um, the brand, innocent name, uh, here. So again, it's happening in you know, some many places. Again, uh, these great individuals uh, are innocent doing their, uh, they're just uh, uh, making their own way. Uh, no matter what kind of organizations you know behind them, or well, sometimes there's no organization behind them. So that's a MOOC. And uh, uh, again, Kyoto University has been doing MOOC too, and I want to uh, quickly show that the very unique one. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of the first uh, MOOCs we created called the Chemistry of Life. And uh, here's a two minute kind of trailer I'd like to sh uh, share with you. And uh, you see why we think this Creative is and innovative ideas are essential to success in any business. However, here of us have had the opportunity to take a course on creating ideas. In high school education, the chemistry and biology are usually treated as separate subjects. In university education, however, separate disciplines are often integrated into a single discipline in which many different ideas can be created. This ethics course focuses on the integrated field between chemistry and biology which allows you to learn how to create new ideas. In fact, many brilliant scientists have created excellent ideas of interface between chemistry and biology. The goal of my course is clear. I will teach the class that I wanted to take when I was an undergraduate student at Kyoto University. In this course, you are asked to come up with your own research ideas based on the content of each lecture. Your ideas are then evaluated and compared with actual research projects. In taking this course, 
I invite you to enter the world of chemistry and biology. I will share my personal experiences as a scientist both in Japan and in the United States. The chemistry of life will change your life. Wow, the anime character showed up. It's a very Japanese taste. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, uh, Osamu Tezuka is a uh, uh, you know very famous uh, you know animator uh, who deceased uh, a while ago, and uh, that quite un unknown character called Milmo, uh, you know I remember when maybe I when I was like eight years old, uh, was on the TV for just short time you know period of time, and uh, that girl uh, was taking. Uh, they, they, she has uh, two small bottles of uh, red pill and blue pill. And when she took a red pill, she grew up like this. In, and then the two, take two pills, you know, 10 years or three pills, 15 years or so, something like that. And so she could control uh, her age to realize her whatever she wants to do. And as uh, Professor Wesugi said, uh, you know, I really like that girl. <laughs> anime girl, and maybe that, you know, uh, when he was in elementary school, uh, that influenced stayed, and then that's why he became chemist. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> so what anime can do um, to one's life or profession, I think that's quite so. Again, you know, after listening that episode, I uh, and my colleagues decided to uh, contact. Uh, you know, Osamu Tezuka Productions and uh, uh, try to get the uh, uh, right to use, uh, you know, this girl Milmo, you know, character Milmo. So that's sorry, that's off, off track a little bit. But uh, uh, as you just heard, this is very interesting, you know, some course, not just to learn uh, biology, chemistry, but uh, it's how to think creatively uh, based on the knowledge of uh, chemistry and biology. And here's a crazy uh, e example, Tusk, in, a, in this MOOC. And he got this uh, chart uh, which listed a uh, hundred popular medicines you know, so, uh, around the world with these uh, uh, chemical structures. Right? And this, uh, uh, so the tens of thousands of uh, people taking this MOOC, pick one, each of them pick one, uh, and then draw character uh, who actually uh, you know showed the effect of that particular medicine so the middle one for example this is an anti uh, depression <laughs> this you know medicine and the girl uh, you know spinning on the floor was uh, you know doing break dance uh, it looks like you know that the chemical structure right so you might just laugh but uh, again uh, the youngest was, uh, I think, six years old. The oldest, eighty something years old. They came up. So imagine the so tens of thousands of these kind of drawings coming, you know, in, in to this MOOC from all over the world. Uh, you know, so Professor Wasugi was very thrilled to uh, actually he went through the, each one of them um, too. So again, uh, you know, it's very, uh, you know, I'll. Uh, I don't have time to uh, uh, talk more about this particular course, but uh, what he also is doing is peer evaluations and you know students kind of uh, uh, reviewing each other's you know homework too, and it wasn't you know so easy, uh, and not many uh, students you know everybody wanted to reviewed by that professor, but again instead they got peers. And so there was, uh, uh, you know, un un unsatisfied, you know, numbers of this group, the increasing numbers, and so it's, you know, so it's on fire basically, you know, online. So we learned, you know, a lot, like how to do this correctly or more fairly, you know. So. But what's uh, the reason I wanted to share this particular? Uh, talk about this particular MOOC is uh, this professor Uesugi is so innovative in just uh, taking full advantage, MOOC is MOOC, you know, a lot uh, these days, but uh, uh, he came up with, you know, ideas after ideas to, you know, best use, you know, some this online, you know, course. So he conducted uh, this contest online and uh, uh, you know, 
hundred thousand you know students apply, and uh, they you know uploaded uh, two minute video presentations, right? And this is a, a student from Peru, for example. And so uh, we are uh, judging you know some of these uh, students' virtual presentations here. And uh, we selected you know five. Uh, students and then uh, learners and then I invited them to the campus and uh, two of those five uh, learners actually uh, decided to become uh, enter the uh, graduate school in you know, North Dakota University so so it's a very interesting way of meeting you know so with the future uh, students here and also though they join uh, in face-to-face -face classrooms uh, with other uh, students at Kyoto University, so it's a blended um, by blended, you know, some here blended learning, but also you know students, you know, uh, virtual st uh, online students are blended with the face-to-face students. Any rate, so uh, as you know, as is uh, rapid, rapidly uh, spreading as a MOOC. I'm delighted to keep uh, platform is uh, actually growing in Hong Kong. To, uh, for uh, many uh, people to access uh, one-stop access you know, some to these online courses, and as you may know, um, there are over you know ten thousand uh, courses you know, available, and hundred million students learners are taking this, and uh, in a very diversified, um, balanced you know, subject area available. So that's I used to call this uh, evolutions or de-evolutions of education. The making MOOC is like a making cup noodle uh, of many different tastes. Uh, and the size-wise, you know, there is a big one, uh, six weeks, four weeks, or maybe a baby-sized, you know, one. So again, it's not the same, you know, some two typical uh, college courses here. It's usually kind of fixed relations. It's, it's not that flexible in terms of uh, how many hours you need to spend to learn things. So uh, here I think uh, it's uh, uh, like liberal arts, you know, college, a good one. And, uh, uh, but it's becoming, the world is becoming more like a mega liberal arts, uh, you know, so education uh, like this, given the 10,000 uh, courses. But then we really have to think about what kinds of knowledge and skills are you know, we're learning and uh, through this. But it's a very easy metaphor here is, uh, uh, I don't know if you've seen this uh, Iron Chef contest in you know, a TV show. Uh, maybe similar ones are very pop popular here in Hong Kong. It's great chefs uh, in Hong Kong, I think. So uh, uh, chefs of many different cuisines uh, are competing with each other. Right? to make a great dish. And so this can be, again, the MOOC's world. Uh, these teachers competing with each other is very unique, effective, you know, some practice uh, teaching. And, of course, the students, you know, should have infinite uh, appet you know, appetite, you know, some to consume all this in the ideal world. So that, you know, we could see the higher education become more like an intellectual buffet. <laughs> so, if you like or not, too, all you can learn. Right? So, uh, we have 20 more minutes, um, and uh, this is uh, coming to the, uh, towards the end of my, uh, this uh, workshop. We have a, a couple more uh, topics, but I really like to uh, uh, get some feedback and ideas from you on this one. So, a um, little tricky uh, questions. How do you think we can innovate and take advantage of abundance of MOOCs and other open education resources, uh, including even YouTubes and other things, yeah, uh, voice tubes? As instructors, professionals, and others. 
So again, I, I don't want you to uh, think about MOOCs, but uh, knowing you know, this many MOOCs are available, and what we owe in you know, to uh, what we could um, start doing, um, either using uh, you know building on these MOOCs, or well, if uh, some educations are covered by these online, massive online courses, then what we should really focus on? Well, combining all these things, uh, online and maybe uh, you know, offline, you know, learning, uh, what kind of new system, you know, education system we could create? Uh, I know I'm asking a lot. Uh, in two minutes, uh, giving you two minutes <laughs> here, here, but uh, uh, it was totally unimaginable 20 years ago. You know, over 10,000 uh, free, good quality courses available. But I think universities, colleges are not really changing in so much. And there's maybe cultural or social value, you know, some kind of uh, aspect, you know, some of this. But uh, uh, if you, you know, try to free yourself, you know, some from, you know, this existing, um, you know, whatever is, uh, uh, you know, restriction, you know, from the uh, current systems of education, what can we do? And we, uh, I'm uh, hoping to see some kind of punchy, <laughs> interesting, uh, and we can say crazily interesting, you know, idea. You know, I know I'm asking a lot. So again, uh, this time is a five. Uh, this is first time for me to see the five-digit code, usually six digits, but uh, I think a better photo, uh, twenty, uh, so seventy twenty-six four. realizes his questions are getting tougher and tougher, <laughs> so uh, I'm giving you a hard time probably, but uh, please take it easy and uh, again, I, I shouldn't uh, uh, place your dear. Any ideas? Maybe you feeling uh, how uh, typical college students are uh, feeling in active learning. <laughs>
right? <laughs> Maybe you're the, you're you're tired of the hard working day after the hard working day. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, if you, I would start with uh, probably no schools. <laughs> <laughs> something like that and then uh, maybe all project-based um, learning uh, outside of school and I can create uh, a lot of enemies uh, as, as in academia uh, by saying something like this but I think uh, we really should um, oh thank you can some introduction yes Yes, so we can just free up and uh, making uh, you know the degree requirement more flexible, and uh, turning you know all this you know, engineering degree you know or uh, you know whatever uh, in some degrees uh, kind of loosen up, not expanding, and then uh, you know they can take other uh, disciplinary courses um, easily, and so like a joint degree or dual degree, you know, or some majors, and these, and also collaboration uh, between, you know, uh, international collaborations, right? So like uh, five schools, uh, you know, so five departments from five different universities from five countries, you know, could maybe create joint degree you know, some course easily. Uh, again, you know, some Courses still need to be taken, uh, per, you know, face to face. But maybe there's a lot of shared, you know, some online courses towards, you know, getting that interdisciplinary, something like this. And I think it's happening, right? I maybe have heard micro master or micro bachelor. Uh, here, I think HK uh, in Hong Kong, HKUST is and PolyU, I think, is uh, doing. Uh, micro master, which is uh, half of the master uh, programs can be done uh, online, something like that. But again, it's just a uh, uh, beginning. I think uh, we'll see a more flexible, you know, some more uh, diversified interdisciplinary uh, in education programs and system uh, be uh, built upon, you know, these open tools, uh, resources, and courses, too. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'll, I have 10 minutes or so. I slightly changed the plan from here. Uh, so, originally I have, I prepared the two more questions like this, but maybe you <laughs> I see uh, responding in a slow mind. So uh, I'll just open up the floor after uh, talking about these uh, two topics in a sense quickly. I hope you are fine with that. So the first one is uh, it's quite entertaining, it's a Michael versus Michael. So do you know the first guy, also famous in Hong Kong, it's, um, Michael Sandel uh, from Harvard. Uh, he's known for you know doing his teaching in this auditorium kind of style and still making it very interactive. And uh, I think everybody knows the the bottom one, uh, Michael, right? Uh, so which one is real? You may say, are you crazy? It's the most real. The second one is actually uh, created, not the real Michael Jackson. It's a uh, you know, 3D gen computer generated Michael Jackson. The song was real. Uh, he recorded that song. But uh, his dancing and his appearance is so all artificially created, but still performed in the real life, you know, hall, concert hall. Uh, with the real people, real back dancers, with real back dancers. So it's quite amazing uh, what the modern technology could do, uh, you know, to uh, revive you know, even the dead in some people. The scary implications of that 
Uh, there may be a uh, lot of that great researchers and teachers, right? And if we have enough data, can we maybe replicate <laughs> them? And they can start teaching maybe something new. So again, you know, I know this is uh, scary and maybe crazy, but uh, again, you know, if we talk about genetic re-engineering, you know, maybe this is a more ethical thing, <laughs> you know, something to do, I don't know. Um, but then, uh, you know, virtual idols, as uh, many of you know, um, again, this is a very, uh, this is great business model, right? You don't need to hire as a real uh, artist, right? You can just create and that's a she, someone like a Mitsu, you know, Mitsu Hatsune can work 24 hours in you know, seven days, right? <laughs> and uh, still performing in a real concert with uh, real people, you know, some playing real instruments. And I think we're getting into something like this. And uh, maybe you have heard this uh, Georgia Tech experimented with, uh, uh, I think, the world's first uh, uh, AITA. And the funny thing, so this is uh, uh, program, uh, introduction to programming and upper MOOC. And there are several TAs around discussion forums, Q&A session. And one of them was uh, was uh, AI. The funny episode uh, is uh, nobody could tell, nobody realized there was an AI uh, among this. And so they, let, they got uh, this AI TA a lot of thank you letters as a person <laughs> uh, from all these uh, you know, hundreds of uh, uh, donors taking this MOOC. So, you know, this is possible because it's a programming course, you know, very uh, logical thing. And the students' questions are mostly about algorithms, you know, and how to program things, you know, techniques. So it was very, fairly easy for AI to respond based on what human TAs and professors uh, were responding to the past questions. Right? So again, uh, in a lot of interesting, uh, again, this one is just uh, uh, around and a uh, uh, few, few weeks ago uh, in Japan's NHK, the National Broadcasting Station, uh, showed this very interesting program. This is a great uh, singer called Mizora Hibari, uh, you know, died uh, 20 years ago. And if you remember that the virtual Michael Jackson Again, that the thing, uh, song was uh, already recorded by him when he was alive. alive. This time, uh, they composed a new song with a new lyrics by very famous uh, you know, people. And then, uh, again, recreated everything uh, as you know, this person, uh, Hibari Mizora, was. And I was very curious watching you know, some of this program, see so the, at the end, they got this, uh, like Michael Jackson, got a huge concert hall and, uh, you know, 3D hall room, you know, Mizura Hibari was singing new song, you know, with some uh, gesture. And I was curious, these uh, f uh, old fans of her were moved emotionally, even cried or not. And they did. Many of them did. And you know those, and even there's a family members also crying too. And I was very puzzled. And my wife was very uncomfortable watching that. Why people crying? It's not, it's fake too. But again, uh, the technology is fortunately or unfortunately maturing, you know, at this stage. And we might be able to design the teachers you like. Everybody you know, has favorite teachers from elementary school, kindergarten, you know, middle school. And I've been talking with uh, university professors. Many of them said, I became a you know, mathematician because I really like mathematics teachers in middle school, something like that. 
So again, I really like you. There's no answer to anything here. But again, uh, as you see, you know, the 50 years old uh, illustrations from the Jumidon magazine, the teachers was on screen. Right? And again, what if you can design, you know, somebody, personalized teachers for, for each one of you. So again, I uh, skip, you know, a few things and also, uh, uh, but again, uh, as we just talked about, uh, you, know, in, you know, we can learn uh, more interdisciplinary ways. And again, this leads us, you know, some to uh, great opportunities for lifelong learning, uh, building different expertise. Uh, and again, society uh, will become more like the networked world of these people with uh, many different talents and expertise, right? And so the, uh, this is my last slide here. Um, do you know a game of life? I guess uh, many of you played. And uh, through my uh, graduate seminar, I gave them this uh, insane task of redesigning. This uh, typical uh, traditional game of life is very untrue um, unrealistic now because if you think about uh, traditional game of life what's the influence of education maybe in the first five minutes the game if you go to college or not if you go to college then you became medical doctors lawyers teachers right and then uh, and typically you can earn some good money if you, if you don't go they can still become maybe baseball players, great athletes, singers, right? But again, is that the only influence of education on your life? <laughs> you know, that would be very pity, right? So again, given this abundance, you know, so open learning opportunities, resources, tools, I ask, you know, some young graduate school students, graduate students, well, here's your opportunity to totally redesign. It's the 21st century versions of, uh, you know, game of life. And what they came up after six months <laughs> was uh, very interesting. Uh, of course, it's a long, long life, in its long life, lifelong learning is fundamental. They removed the concept of occupations. No baseball player, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You can become anything, anytime. And maybe a life expectation will be over 100 years, or maybe 200 years, right? And also multiple intelligence skills. And it's important. Uh, it's not about how much money you have. And that's only uh, criteria uh, in the traditional game of life. You know, when you uh, finish the goal line, all it matters is how much money you have after you die. die right? Um, so again, uh, these are all new elements um, you know, and values you know, of the new society and it's coming to new society. And oh, interesting thing is a global crisis. Um, usually just the individuals competing each other, so that's a game of life. But uh, if you know, one stops at this global you know, crisis in some place, then we just contribute to whatever the multiple intelligence we have and the sum, you know, does not reach to the certain score, then everybody's lose. <laughs> so that's a game over for everybody. And that reflects uh, the current, you know, kind of modern world, um, you know, where we live, you know, right now. So again, I, uh, <laughs> this is a, uh, uh, my last slides really and uh, I wanted to uh, uh, I want to uh, finish you know my um, talk uh, in this workshop by uh, quoting uh, John Dewey uh, said over 100 years ago no computers no real machines anything uh, but he said if we teach today as we taught yesterday we will watch a window tomorrow and uh, living in the 21st century, 
I uh, tweaked this a little bit and I came up with this we learned today. Well, maybe we don't need teachers, or teachers are maybe virtual, artificial, or just uh, resources. Uh, if you le learn today as we learned yesterday, we will love ourselves, you know, so tomorrow. Uh, because we're no, no longer talking about just ch children, but again, we are all mothers, you know, throughout our life. And thank you. And uh, uh, I know uh, I'm uh, between you and bed, your bed. <laughs> but uh, if you have any uh, last uh, short kind of comments or uh, whatever questions, uh, I'd be very happy to uh, annotate, entertain. Any comments? Uh, hope you feel like you wasted time, uh, your precious night. Uh, what do you think about this uh, artificial virtual teachers? Do you want to see that uh, soon or you feel more like uncomfortable doing that? Because that's our choice, right? In my talk tomorrow, I'll, I'll show you some other, uh, maybe not a present, present things, but uh, again, technically possible uh, in education. Too. Any? Comments? Yes. So thank you for your uh, great presentation. And I just have one thought. Um, there are so many uh, resources online available for us to teach, uh, to learn. But um, how can we ensure the quality? Yeah, because everyone can make videos and they can upload online and everyone can learn from these videos but are the content uh, right or wrong we can uh, we cannot ensure the quality so um, maybe uh, this is an ethical question and we need more uh, systematic policies to ensure the quality and the quality of the teachers so this is my thought thank you very much thank you it's a great question and well, maybe short answers, like, like everybody I can think of, is like uh, uh, reviewing uh, rating uh, by users or learners, right? Like a shopping site, right? But it's not easy as shopping site because if you want a great, um, uh, you know, microwave, everybody wants just a microwave, right? And everybody has shared the concept of microwave right? for most of the time, right? And so again, you know, if you, uh, many others said this is very good, you can believe that. But uh, uh, educational resources, uh, materials, is very tricky because everybody has its very different uh, learning context, different background, and different learning styles, personality, right? So if one material or course works for that one person. And they said, well, this is the best of the best. I give 100 out of 100, right, or five stars. Uh, that doesn't need to be true to everybody, right? So what I advocate for is uh, finding some kind of similar uh, group, you know, sort of people who have a different, you know, personality, style, background, and then uh, we can just trust that kind of a peer uh, rating um, evaluations. And then uh, making good stuff uh, more visible. I'm kind of personally against the idea of the authority, uh, whatever this education committee, whatever, so the, the great teachers group judging and giving this is good, this is bad. Again, that's not that easy. It's very uh, com com complicated, right? So, uh, but it's a great question. And 